Uh, but let's um, get on with the conversation. We know that uh, we're here today because we're celebrating the man, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of the Republic of Ghana. Uh, but for all the things that we have to talk about, we also know that prior to now, there's been a controversy, uh, of course, stoked by an announcement by the presidency uh, that what we used to know before this year as the Founders Day will now become the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day. And that had a lot more people talking because even prior to the announcement, we had had an event that was um, marked in Salpong on August 4, 2017, which of course to, was to commemorate all the efforts that were made, made uh, on, uh, on August 4, 1947 by those great leaders of the UGCC, the United Gold Coast Convention. And uh, we know all the history to it. But today we're here to talk um, generational issues, but historical issues as well, with young people, with young people of influence. We're talking Chief uh, Moomin, and he's uh, a poet, but uh, he's also a historian in many respects. He's a Pan-Africanist. And another Pan-Africanist definitely would have to be Ibrahim Ajay, but he's also a politician, and um, I have him. I have uh, him here, and thanks for joining me. Uh, he works with the presidency as well, a member of the MPP, and so with the Dankwa Buzia Dumbo tradition. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. All right. But um, we know that the, the, we've had great issues that we have to talk about, all of historical prominence from different perspectives of the political divide. But I have to start with the chief, mm -hmm. woman. Uh, what would you say uh, have been the highlight of all the controversies that have been raging on up to now? Highlights, I mean, for me, would be at least our history is up for debate. I mean, when, as a, someone who is very much interested in history and who puts together place on Ghana's history, I'm often sad that as a people we seem not to pay a lot of attention to our history and we don't, I mean, appreciate the nuances of that history. So if there is any highlight to this whole thing, I think that the history has been up for debate. And I've always felt that we need to get a consensus on our history, on our struggle for independence. 60 years on, we should all be operated on a wavelength, but we haven't had that conversation. So probably the positive thing that comes out of this is that we would have that conversation and hopefully at the end of the day we can reach a consensus going forward so that our generation and coming generations will not continue to you know, perpetrate the acrimonies of the past. Mm. Highlights um, of, of all the events up to now. Well, a very good morning to you. Good morning to you. My brother Chief as well, and our viewers on, on Joy. Um, the highlights of the events as pertains to what? Because I heard you answer. Of, of, of the controversies that uh -huh. have raged on up to now. And I, I think, I can't pinpoint a highlight, to be honest with you, Roland. But what I can do is, I think the signature that is coming out is that you see our democracy at work. Democracy is, as they would say, is governed of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it's uh, the second part that I want to refer to, by the people. And we are doing that. We are espousing that by the people element of democracy, whereby we can have a dialogue, we may have a difference of opinion on this issue of Founders Day, apostrophe before the S or after the S, who founded Ghana, who, who, who got our independence for us. And that, that dialogue, that conversation we're having, is I think where the highlight, with the small H is for me that we can, in, in a mature manner, Ghanaians can have a discussion. And we've been having it, not today, but for some time now. Um, and I think that's where, I think, uh, somebody looking back, looking at what's the narrative going on between Ghanaians within the political ideologies can say, wow, these, these people are really on mark. Well, they're not taking cutlasses to each other, but they are having intellectual debate they're having, if you, if, even if you will, market debate, whereby our market women, taxi drivers, everybody's engaged in the process of understanding and contributing to this issue, this controversy. And I think that's the highlight for me. We, we all have read history. I mean, not as a subject in school, because not, not many people have. But at the end of the day, history is the, 
uh, for, us, for us to do a lot more introspection and guide us, etc. But when it comes to Ghana, we know um, colonialism brought different perspectives on how the Africa needed to behave towards the British. And also that's um, realization and self-recognition that having the ability to preside over your own affairs was critical. And, and w w we've been told over the last couple of weeks, if not days, uh, that we have to trace it beyond, but of course starting from uh, the effort of the uh, Abor Aboriginal Rights Protection Society and, and all that. Uh, is that what we have to perhaps trace a history to as far as our independent struggle is concerned? Yes, moving. Yes, I mean, of course, I, I believe that our independence struggle was not an instantaneous affair. It was a process that, you know, led to several actors contributing their quota towards the independence struggle. Even when it came to the process of s the Europeans coming in, slave trade, there were always resistance to slave trade. You know, there were always wars, people resisting trade, slave trade, all to the time of colonialism when the British annexed the Gold Coast territories. There were always people, organizations, who were either fighting for greater participation of people of Gold Coast in the affairs of, you know, the management of Gold Coast, or whether it was the active struggle for independence. So this is where I stand in the whole debate, which I think is really much ado about nothing. I hope I'm not jumping the gun. I feel that a false promise premise has been set that if you take a look at our independence struggle, we have kind of like heralded Dr. Kwame Nkrumah as the be it and end all of that struggle and that he is the one who founded Ghana and in so doing we have not paid particular attention to other actors in that independence struggle. But I beg to differ. I think that any elementary reading of Ghana's history would show you the processes that went through before we got our independence, the nationalist movements that came up, the Kesley Hayfalls, before the UGCCs. I think that the history is quite documented. The problem here is that I think that Nkrumah enjoys hype more than all the other actors who participated in the independence struggle. And that is understandable. And I don't even think that the hype is something that Ghanaians have deliberate, deliberately orchestrated over the years. I think that Nkrumah's renown is really worldwide. And the rest of the world kind of like heralded him, voted him African of the you know 20th century and all that. And Ghanaians simply caught up. But not because we have deliberately put, put Nkrumah at a pedestal to the disadvantage of the other you know actors in our independence struggle. I mean, we have the Dankwa Circle. You take a look at our, our notes, you know, the Bixes are dead here in our faces all the time. I think the proper problem here is that as a people, we don't really appreciate our history or we don't really read much of our history. So it's like, you know, if you don't know your English, it's just not your maybe good morning and your good afternoon. So if you don't know your Ghanaian history at all, at least you know that Nkrumah played a role. So I feel that, I don't feel that we have neglected the other actors. I don't feel that we haven't, you know, acknowledged them. They are in the history all right. And if you do any element, reading from primary to GSS to university, you would be well conversant with all the processes that led to our independence. I agree that Nkrumah enjoys hype, but I don't feel that that hype has been a deliberate orchestration. I think that it's just because of the important role that he played, the fact that he won several elections, he was leader of government, business, prime minister and president. So if you take the history books, the history would definitely contain more pages about Nkrumah than probably other independence uh, you know, actors because he went past the goalposts, he became the and he did a lot more stuff. So for me, that's where I stand in this whole debate. I don't feel we have neglected other people. I feel Nkrumah enjoys a hype, understandably so. But I feel that it's also a function of the fact that probably we don't pay closer attention to our history. So the little that we know is probably the man who is most exposed in the whole debate. Mm. Mm. You just ended my interview here today. <laughs> so, I asked, <laughs> so, so I asked the question about yeah. if we have to do int some introspection and, and trace a history, yeah. would we say that... Um, uh, well, starting from when we had the Aboriginal Rights Protection Society fighting for the cause of um, ownership of land, etc., would be where perhaps we can situate that in, in a certain struggle for some level of autonomy or perhaps uh, self-rule. Chief Moomin. Yes. Oh, you're asking me again? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no, I think you was surprised. It. Oh, yeah. Well, the Aboriginal <laughs> Rights Protection, and I think it played a very important role, mm. Not, uh, I mean, with the sponsorship of John Say. I think that one of the reasons why Ghana is not South Africa or Zimbabwe is because of that single important action that they, they did to protect our lands from annexation from the British. Other than that, all the lands in this country would have been vested in the hands of the British Queen. So it was a moment of resistance. It was a specific moment of resistance to protect the lands of our 
country from being taken over by the British. So I think that's a very important rule. But I don't think that you can say this is the starting point of resistance. I think that the starting point of resistance, you can stretch it even to the beginning of you know, uh, colonialism or even to the beginning of slave trade. All those who resisted the slave trade, all those who resisted the British taking us over to their lands, could, it's a point of resistance. So at what point do you start? So I feel that all of these contributory factors, when we resisted the British as slave traders, when we resisted the British from taking over our lands, when we resisted the British from taking over our territories, you know, people like Yas and Tua who fought the last war to prevent Britain from annexing the Ashanti and all that. So these were all built up and points of, you know, resistance that culminated in August to the formation of the first political party that was geared towards the liberation agenda. That's the UGC. So of course, the Aborigines' Right Protection Society has played an important role. The Fanti Confederation has played an important role, you know, in our history. And I think that all of these moments of resistance are key. But I don't think that those were the definitive moments of our independence. They were all contributory processes that led to that definitive moment of us getting independence. Mm. Yeah, Ibrahim, so what do you think? If we have to perhaps make sure we undertake due recognition, um, what, where then do we start? Well, I think one of the embarrassments of our history as a people is that all we have is oral history to rely upon. It's interesting that as Chief Moomin was speaking, he was positioning our history, which is his story, our story, in a political context. Where is the social history of the indigenous people of the area known now as Ghana? Where is that history? I mean, unless you look at the Katamanto War and uh, issues between the Bronx and the Ashantis, you know, how is it that in 1844, you know, you had the bond of 1844 coming in because the Fantis were looking for protection with the British from who the Ashantis, you know, and it's all in a political context. What was the history of the Fantis before 1844? Where is that recorded? And that is the embarrassment of we as a people, with the exception of Ethiopia, who have a, a, an alphabet, who have a written history. They have chronologically audited and written down their history. If you go to Abyssinia, the king of Negus, in terms of how his interaction with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Ethiopia stands apart from Africa, where the rest of us have an oral history. It's not written down. And so we can only couch our history at a certain point in time, starting with the Portuguese and the British and the Dutch coming here. And that's an embarrassment. Why did I preface my submission with this? To explain that, you said to me, at what point do we start, isn't it? Yeah. And really, we should start a lot longer ago. The JB Dankwa traced our, uh, let's say, political affiliation, not lineage, I would say, but political affiliation um, as a people with Kanka Musa. I'm talking Ghana. And uh, you had the Almoravids and the Sonyinke, who were there, okay, who again founded that empire that is well lauded. And why is it lauded? Because Arab traders actually documented it. Then you have the Sino African history, mm -hmm. Sino with the S I N O, mm -hmm. Chinese history. The Chinese, when they visited Africa, specifically Mali, you know, Timbuktu, they were able to, not able to, but they actually, again, because they have you know, the, the Chinese alphabet, and uh, they were able to document it. So when you go to research institutions in Beijing and looking at Sino-African history, again, they've actually documented. I'm a student of history, studied at Kingston College. So they've actually documented their interactions with the Mali Empire, or Songhai, which stretched from the Sahel mm. through to mm. Libya, uh, through to Sudan, Egypt, or Misr, and then back. Mm. And that's where we know region. that, yeah. yes, and that's how we know that the Ghana Empire, from which we take our name, had universities or centers of learning with glass windows, per not the African oral uh, recollection, but the Chinese record. Good. I just wanted to couch my submission there. So where do we start with Ghana? Isn't it an embarrassment that to talk about the struggles, Chief Moomin, and I would agree with him, we can only assume that there was a struggle for slavery, against slavery. Because you think it's a natural uh, reaction to resist being captured and enslaved. So it would be right. But where is it documented? Where are our own Rosa Parks? 
and uh, is it Henrietta Tubman? Am I right? Mm. Where are they in our history? Apart from the Yas and Twa that you mentioned, uh, where are they? Where are our Martin Luther Kings before when the Portuguese arrived? They're nowhere to be found. So I'm coming to my submission. Forgive me for the delay. Where we can start it has to be with the Portuguese, has to be with the British. And you would look at maybe what, what precipitated the 1844 bond. There was raids from Asante Kingdom into the Fanti areas. And they looked for protection from an alien protector. And that set the, 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 the seal from whereby now they were able to enter our affairs. I'm talking the British. And so beyond that, going to 1897, the Aborigine Rights Protection Society, when that was formed, and Chief is perfectly right, it enabled us to have a different trajectory to what experience was experienced in South Africa or Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. But beyond that, I think that when and other commentators will say, beyond securing our land rights, politically, a lot of commentators, historical commentators that is, look at the First World War as being, if you will, a catalyst for... The turning point. A turning point, mm -hmm. whereby we can pinpoint an event whereby our soldiers went off, they were fought in Burma, came back, uh, and then said, hold on, we've been fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe with these... Europeans. And some of them have been dying in the Yes, process. and they're no different to us. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been dying and we have been surviving. Exactly. So why can't we survive? Why can't we? And then they came back and, 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 and understood that that experience abroad, coming back, why are we being treated differently? Why are we not getting our service pensions? And all those things came into the fore. It really excited again in this after the Second World War, but the First World War was the turning point, whereby that consciousness came up and said, hold on, we are not being treated right. And then, of course, you had others who had traveled. Mm. Um, George Alfred Grant, or Pa Grant, as he's known. Uh, 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 he, he was a, an industrialist, but a timberman. You know? And he had um, uh, uh, businesses in La Côte d'Ivoire. He traveled abroad to Europe. And he was able, this is 1907. And so he was able to see that, hold on, what is happening here? And here you have, in a colonial setting, an African, I'm talking Pa Grant, having his own quote-unquote um, empire in the logging industry, in the timber industry, enabling him to travel. Him and other like-minded people were again of the view that we are not being treated fairly. Mm. Hence the, the thing, no representation without taxation. That came about, you know. And then let's not forget what was happening in the North. You know, when, when we, we, we talk about S.D. Dombo, Simeon Diedong Dombo, of the Dombo Buzia tradition, uh, Buzia Dombo uh, Danko tradition. What was happening in the Northern Territories? Again, there was again agitation for emancipation of cert certain economic uh, experiences, if I can call it that. So even though we were disparate and everybody was fighting their corner, you know, uh, I, I would say that the turning point can be traced to post-1900, 1914, 1917 when that consciousness arose and said there has to be a change. We cannot continue. But before that, there was disconnected events, social um, um, resistance, which because of our oral history has not been captured. And who would capture it? The whites would only capture it for themselves. You know, they said until the lions have their own historians, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter because the lion has not told you what he did. In that, in but that Ibrahim, at the end of the day, we know that for all students of history, there's always what is contemporary. And, and if we have to do a, a great recollection of what our contemporary political or socioeconomic history is concerned, then the roles played by these characters that you mentioned, and significantly those that are able to influence the colonialists in such a way that they bring emancipation mm. uh, come to the fore when we have to do that great recollection. And that is what those outside the shores of our continent tend to remember. Mm. Uh, that also brings to the fore the roles played by the protagonists or these characters in our history. Uh, now, how do we situate that to, uh, to mean what sort of relevance it will mean to our present emancipation mm. when we talk about 
how Nkrumah needs to be recognized as perhaps uh, the one who led the ultimate foundations for our country. Mm -hmm. And then those who also were part of the forebears mm -hmm. of, of the history and the actions that le led to the ultimate. Mm -hmm. So that then we recognize those who are part sure. and then the leader of that mm -hmm. emancipation. Uh, Roland, for me... Is that, is that not what we're talking about? Yes, that's what we're talking about. It's about recognition. I think the controversy, the highlights, the initial question you asked us is, where are the highlights of this controversy? And for those watching us, what's the controversy? It's co recognition. When you s s filter everything down, it's, have I, has, has my effort been recognized? And I think that's the, the, the two plates that are at play, the shifting plates, and where they rub, you get earthquakes. When, you know, when two seismic plates rub together, you get earthquakes. Uh, but when they move in tandem, it's a smooth uh, geopolitical experience. But here's the thing. Let me say this. For me, Kwame Nkrumah is one of, if not the best African leader we have had in this continent. And you can extrapolate that globally and see where he sits globally. Um, I'm coming from a diplomatic family. So from the age of six, seven years old, all I heard on Saturdays and Sundays when my father, who was a diplomat in the UK and his friends over, was politics. This is the 1970s, no internet. So I just consumed what was being discussed at the dinner table and in the garden. And I, I fell in love with the idea of Nkrumah because he represented to me something that I, I hadn't experienced before, such a strong visionary and way he wanted to mold our destinies, not just the country, our destinies as a people. And I got this because of what my parents and their friends were talking about. You can only be influenced by your environment. Had we been talking about maybe just J.B. Dankwa or just maybe Herbert Macaulay of Nigeria or Namde Zikwe, the great Zika of Nigeria, um, Bafemi, Alo Alo, and Cohen, you know, it depends on who is in your purview. So I fell in love with Nkrumah. And then as I matured by 11, 12, reading his books more, I came to appreciate the vision of the man. Why am I saying this? Because we cannot in any way, shape or form somehow diminish Kwame Nkrumah at all. He's a fantastic leader. Having said that, we should not, in the same vein, diminish the efforts of all those personalities who led to him scoring the goal. Mm. You know, you can have a striker who is there in the 18 box and he just taps the goal in. But the midfielder, the defense, all that they did, we can say, wow, what a great play. But who gets the credit? The striker. That's the reality of life. The striker, all he, all he may do is just head the ball or tap it in and hey, best striker in the world. But the defense took the ball from <laughs> the opposition past 11 people. Um, you know, the midfield controlled the game. And then they saw a striker. And they gave it to him. And they, they gave it to him. It. And that's, he scored. And he scored. That's not to and say. And his name will be on the score sheet. Of course. Sheet. Okay. That's, so, I think so, that's so, the reality so, we have here. Okay. But at the end of the, the period, the thing is, somebody would need to be recognized. Mm -hmm. If I travel, uh, and the few times I've traveled, um, I'm recognized by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, if I say I come from Ghana, mm -hmm. or the Black Stars, mm -hmm. because we went to the World Cup subsequently for from 2006 and consolidated our effort in 2010. That is significant for me. Uh, that is outside our, mm -hmm. our frontiers, our, our, our boundaries. Mm -hmm. But how do we synchronize mm -hmm. that level of recognition of Nkrumah outside mm -hmm. our boundaries? And then that sort of recognition we have to give him, perhaps if it's, he's, he's the founder, of course, which now has been changed or, or not. And, and how would that be significant enough for the others who also led the struggle? I mean, I mean, well, Ibrahim has also put it quite nicely with his football analogy that at the end of the day is the person who scores the goal that whose name would be prominent. But if you do a further read it, and if you go and read a match analysis, they'll probably tell you that this person passed the ball to that person and that person passed it to this. So you get at least, so that person's role has not been obliterated. And for me, that forms the basis of my comment all this while, that the role of the other leaders, the Dankwas, the Boozias, the Pagrans, the John Says, all of them, their role has not been Before now, yes. before the announcement by the yes. presidency, yes. 
had it been no it hasn't it, that's my point before the announcement it had never been obliterated and that's why i made the point that from infancy but that national symbolism had not been there beyond their statues yes and, and that's my point that as a are. nation the most i think that the real problem here is that we have not been able to develop our history to an extent that it bends on the national consciousness and i sit here and that's why it's, well, I, i'm doing what i'm doing and i sit here and i look at ghana's history the important role we played in the transatlantic slave trade the important role we played in the emancipation of africa and i think that this is a story that we can develop and project to the rest of the world at the moment we're not doing it so anything that is happening now is organic it's because of the scholarship of our earlier leaders because they wrote a lot and their works are available in foreign universities that their names are there and people talk about them but as a country we haven't deliberately you know packaged our history to present to the world and i've always sorry all right so um uh, so we have to situate this conversation uh, within better perspective too and we would want other views and so Mamavi also Abwaji um, sat down with um, legal and political stalwart Sam Okujeto and um, we would want to watch that and then we'll come back to the studio and do some wrap up comments for the next uh, 5 to 10 minutes 21st of September as Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day before that we the day had been declared as Founders Day What's the difference? <laughs> well, when you say founders, it means the person who founded uh, Ghana. Uh, that was his day. Because after all, the 21st of September is Kwame Nkrumah's birthday, mind you. So you can see the level of misunderstanding that there arose because people are thinking that Kwame Nkrumah is the founder. And I think the uh, the Dankwa Busia group has always taken the stand that it cannot be correct. That so Kwame Nkrumah didn't... The Nkrumah was not the founder Ghana. of Ghana. In fact, nobody founded Ghana. Because it was Gold Coast that was changed on Independence Day to Ghana. But then when you read the historical document, you will see that there was reference to Ghana long before 1957. But he sure led us. To yes, that is true, but um, I'm saying that there is still a misconception, a misunderstanding. First of all, let's understand that the UGCC met in 1947 in Salt Pond. It was, I think, December or so of that year that uh, Akwaji, who was one of the members at the time, where you can see this, so we might refer to as the big six. It was he who suggested to Dankwa and the others to say that, hey, I met a young man when I was studying in the U.S. He is now in London. Uh, I think he has a vibrancy and the, person, the right person to come and be the general secretary of UGCC. Because after all, Kwaje was a lawyer practicing. Dankwa was a lawyer that was practicing. Akufado was a lawyer that was practicing. Uh, Pagrat and the Red were businessmen who were looking after their business. None of them has time to go around Ghana and say that they are trying to whip up the enthusiasm of the people to agitate for independence. So they needed somebody who can do the work. And they thought that that was a young man who was the right person. So they sent for him. They paid his passage to come. Kuba did not come by himself. They paid his passage. In fact, when he came, he was an employee of the UGCC. I was being paid salary to do the work. Now, therefore, but the term Ghana was already there. That was being used by Dankwa and the others. And so you cannot say somebody is a founder. I think that's, that is where it's very important for us to understand this. Because I see all the arguments, people are, they see people are saying this and the others are saying that, and I say, no, 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 no. You cannot distort history. History is history. Historically, this is what happened. It was when the misunderstanding arose between them as to whether uh, self-government soon or self-government now. Nice catchy words, but then soon and now, what does it mean? Now does not mean today. And soon does not mean tomorrow or the day after or 10 years from now. Technically, they all mean the same thing. But 
being the agitator, the mind of the people, when you say now, it means, oh, look, we are going to kick the white man out, or we are going to take over everything. So he was successful in the bringing the country to independence. And so we have to acknowledge that. Nobody should deny it. Should we make his birthday a national holiday? Well, that is what I believe it is necessary and useful. Uh, look at Martin Luther King. He didn't actually do anything particular in America except that he moved the blacks and gave them a hope. He is dead. And America acknowledges his day as Martin Luther King Day. So why should we not memorialize the person who had led us to independence? I think it is it's necessary. It should be a holiday. That's the right day to be a holiday. What exactly happened in 1947? Was it the founding of the political party, as in the UGCC? That was the founding of the UGCC. It is those people who met at Salt Pond who took a decision to come together. That's why they call it United Gold Coast Convention. Hmm. The other political parties that have been formed in different years, why should we make one political party's uh, beginning a national holiday? Why should the U be a the UG There is no UGCC but as a political party we have today. So let's again wipe our mind clean of that misunderstanding. Is the NPP not coming out? The NPP that? says that they are the successors of that, but it does not make it eat it. I think that's the misunderstanding. They say that they are, that's their origin. But then I also misinterpret and I say that, okay, that's the origin. But Nkrumah was also the general secretary of the UGCC. So that's also the origin of the CPP also. So when you understand it from that, then of course the argument is dead. There's actually no argument. But why should it be a national day then? No, the national day was to say that our ancestors, at a particular point in time, realized that we can no longer stay under a colonial government, and that it was time for us, as people indigenous of Africa, take the strings of governance into our own hands and govern ourselves. So we need to organize ourselves in order to tell the colonial government to go. And that's exactly what they did. That was exactly what they did. And you remember that events were triggered by the occurrence that was the 24th February of 48. You might even say that it's unrelated in the sense that the ex servicemen who had returned from Burma realized that they were virtually being robbed. Here are people who volunteered. They went to Burma, they went to North Africa, and they fought with the British against the Germans and the Japanese. And those who went, the white people who were in Britain, were well looked after. And here are our own soldiers, they were completely ignored. And so they were marching to Christiansburg Castle to, to see the governor with a petition and say, hey, you can't discriminate against us. We also deserve to be looked after because we preserve the British Empire. And then, of course, Chris Chrissy became crazy and shot the three soldiers at the crossroads. And of course, it inflamed the sentiments of the people. And then the riot set in. The European shops were looted. Of course, the Korean government at that time was thinking that, ah, hey, these UGCC people, they are the cause of, they must have stared the people to do this. So they went and collected them and locked them up. They couldn't prosecute them in the sense that they don't have the evidence. In fact, Pao Willie would tell, laugh at you and say, you know, they sent me to Wa, and they gave me to the district commissioner, and they gave me a bungalow to stay inside. They say, whatever I want, I can ask for it. He said, we don't know whether you were involved in, but at least for safety, it's better 
we do that. So they collected them and locked them up. 28th February, interestingly, is the day that we commemorate. It's not a national holiday. Yeah, it's a commemoration day, that's yeah. true. Why can't August 4 also be a day that we commemorate? Well, there's nothing wrong in commemorating it. There's also nothing wrong in declaration of a holiday. Uh, in fact, the argument against the holiday will be like me and others who say that there are too many holidays, that we should just do away with some of them. That, would, to me, rather would be the argument, mm -hmm. is to say that let it be a commemoration day rather than a national holiday. There's also another side of the argument. Nkrumah was not available on that day. That is also true. So wouldn't we be taking him out as a founding father, as part of the founders, if we're adding, including him and adding all the others who also contributed? Well, you know, someone actually used a particular terminology which I thought was very good. He said, let's call it a hero's day. He says, instead of talking about founders' day, why don't we rather call it a hero's day? So it's a question of the heroes who have all been involved, which, of course, will also include the three, the soldiers who were shot, because they were also part of the heroes. Then we need to choose a neutral date then. No, no, you don't get in the picture. What I'm saying is that if you say it's a hero's day, mm -hmm. then it does not matter what day or so it is. Because all the people who are heroes will be celebrated. Mm. Isn't that what we do on 6th of March? 6th of March? is actually the Independence Day. That was the day, the birthday of Ghana. So you cannot But we still that. acknowledge all the people who contributed to No, the no, 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 no. That's a different, a clear distinction. You see, to commemorate your birthday is a different thing from other events which will happen in your lifetime. And so the 6th of March is actually the birthday of Ghana. It's the Independence Day. You saw that, that that was in the Republic Day, that the day that Ghana was declared a republic, when the queen was no longer queen of Ghana. That also is there. Mm. But I'm just saying that one can raise an argument and say that, why do we have so many holidays in terms of cost to the nation? How much does the nation lose for a day? Because we've even developed a bad habit whereby if the day falls on a Saturday or a Sunday, then we declare the Monday also as a holiday. I don't know where all this came from. But these are matters maybe we should do a little bit of rethinking about and say that, okay, if it is Saturday, let it be Saturday. If it is Sunday, let it be Sunday. There's no reason why you should add an extra day because in all that productivity is lost. And actually billions of cities is lost to the nation because of that alone. So that to me would be the argument. That is worth debating. What do you make of the intention of the president now uh, to go to parliament, get to the subsidiary legislation, and make these holidays uh, law, really? Because all this while we've been using the executive instruments to declare the days as holidays. I suppose you see the reason to make the thing a law by legislation is just to gain to check this whole idea of. One person comes and then he takes a decision as president and then we do it. Rather than something that is the law. And therefore you cannot just come and change it. You remember the argument about, uh, what's his name? Uh, Flagstaff House. Mm. The person who built it gave it the one name. And then somebody else came and, and changed it mm -hmm. to Flagstaff House. Because there was no legislation guarding it. Therefore he just took an executive decision and it was done. It is to prevent things of that nature from happening. Because those who change to Flags Harbor misunderstood what Flags House meant. That was actually the army headquarters, which in Krumah, instead of staying in the castle, moved to. The castle was still seat of government, but he moved to Flags Harbor House, which was actually the army headquarters. Mm. And therefore, the army is no longer there. There was no reason why you should have called the place the flag server.
if you want to, if you have the means to party and remember. But of course, you are going to do that on the 4th of March as well. So, the ability. On the 4th of August? Oh, of, uh, uh, yeah, all of it. All the numerous holidays. For example, we are 70% of the people are Christian. But when uh, the Muslims are celebrating their festival, we all get a holiday. So you ask, I can ask the same question. I say, what do you do? <laughs> when they are praying and slaughtering their sheep, what do you do? It's, it's, it, you, you can see the ridiculousness of some of this matter to be mm. debate, uh, what debating them. What, what would you be up to? My uh, concept of holiday is that I sit in the house and I don't go out. I, I read and if maybe play around the garden or something like that. Or in the old days, I would visit friends. These days, I seldom do that. <laughs> but Enjoy the holiday then. I'm sure I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a good rest. Thank you for your time. Yes, all right. Stay blessed, my dear. We, we've had a great conversation. Mama Muswabwa, you're speaking to legal luminary and politician Sam Okujito. But uh, we would have to say that uh, if, 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 if you do a, a great analysis of, of, of what that he said, and, and now even getting to the point where he's a member of the Council of State, you'll get to find that his great experience over the years um, puts him into a certain perspective of making up his mind as to the roles played by the others in the struggle for independence and the founding of the state Ghana. Uh, and um, sometimes we need some of these people to authenticate the story of, of what roles the others have played and perhaps maybe even what the position of government is on the current day. And the question is? And the question is, his experience comes to bear. So we need a lot more of such people, of him, to come and authenticate the position of government currently mm -hmm. on whether Nkuma should be recognized as a central person in founding Ghana or whether we need to add the others. And so now we have a date here and another date here. Sure. I mean, I, I think it helps the conversation when you have different personalities adding their opinions. Um, you're, you're situating it within government, government's position presently. And government's position presently, and it's a fantastic one, is this. We are recognizing everybody. 21st September has been set aside for the first president of the Republic of Ghana, Dr. Osaje Fukwara. And that's the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day. Yes, yeah, just as you have uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, was he the only um, civil, civil rights, rights leader? Was he the only? But you, he, he, I think generally the first or thereabouts in America, that has been set aside for Martin Luther King. That's his own Memorial Day. And, and, and what the government has done now is recognized August the 4th, 1947, and of course August the 4th, 1897, that's the Aboriginal uh, uh, Rights Protection Society, as principal areas whereby those pivotal events that signaled to the colonialists that we are looking to own our own destinies. Because in August the 4th, 1947 at Salt Pond, when the UGCC was formed, what did they come to do? They came to usher in a political party whose objective was to secure independence. And so, you know, it's recognizing that there were personalities, and, 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 and to the credit of the personalities, they said that there's a, there's a better person or another person who is also fan uh, great. I think that was the word that was used by Akwaje, a brilliant man who is in the UK, and I think if he comes and joins us, we can really get this independence thing going. And so that inclusiveness of the UGCC, yes, there was a divorce in 1949, Kwame Nkrumah setting up the Conventional People's Party, but beyond, before 49, you had a consensus of all the personalities saying, let's work for our independence. And I think it's recognizing that that moment that you had personalities in then, then Gold Coast saying we need to make sure that we secure our independence. And that's what we're recognizing. So I guess the four we're recognizing, uh, we're recognizing as what? Founders Day? It's, you're looking at Founders Day in well, the sense no, that... No, what, what will it be called from hence? That I don't know. I, I want, uh, I no, but it's been stated categorically yes. that Founders Day. Uh, so Atta Mills came. No, yes, I know. Yes. And I know what Atta Mills did. He made but, what? But, so the, but the okay. current status quo, as announced by the press statement, the position of government, yes. is it sustainable? 
No, it's not sustainable. So this is my suggestion. I tell them, I tell them, made 21st September Founders Day. We have a problem with it. So we say, let's call it Nkrumah Memorial Day. So you make 4th August Founders Day, other group of people have problems with it, and it will not sustain it. So why don't we make, okay, 21st September, Nkrumah Nkrumah's Memorial Day, 4th August, UGCC stroke, Aboriginal Rights Memorial Day or something. Because we would not get to consensus on that word founder. Because if we say Nkrumah is the founder, then it presupposes that, you know, some people feel that it gives him too much undue credit and that it doesn't recognize the uh, actors, other actors. But when you also want to set another day as a founder's day and you probably use 4th August, then what about 28 February 1948, you know, the, 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 the also crossroads shooting incident, which will also give momentum to our independence struggle. So which of the many dates, you know, in the history are you going to use as the most significant date towards you know, our independence? It's a matter of interpretation. I feel that fourth, I guess, yes, the NPP with its majority in parliament can see it through, but a different government can as easily you know, take it away. So why don't we find a common ground, a middle ground? Let's celebrate 21st September as Nkrumah's Day. Let's celebrate fourth, I guess, as UGCC Day or something. I don't something. understand all that you're But, your, but your let's avoid the, the nomenclature. Yes, um, the of, trend has been founder. is either NPP or NDC. Oh, yes. And I think the next government, should it next time be yes. NDC? Definitely. No, I think that it's, it's, I mean, the way our politics now is developing, it's more or less like a two-party yes. system, like the Democrats and the and Republicans. That's, and, and that's what will happen. At the, yes. at the end of all the narrative that is being done yeah. is the fact that we want to make sure due recognition is given. Nice. Now, the fact that the president even states that now the Founders Day, which we used to have, and this year has been changed to Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day, um, is going to be what it is. Mm -hmm. Then, even government even recognizes that Nkrumah is a is a is a person and an icon that cannot be taken and just wixed away Absolutely. in a vacuum. Absolutely, and I think that's the mistake that the NDC have done. No, they've assumed. Why would they have done a mistake? No, because that's the narrative that they go on. It's right. It is it not rather? No, no. no the MPP no. that and the no. and the UP tradition that no. is that is failing to recognize not at you. All. you. You just said that the president has set aside 21st September. Remember, up until President Mills, we did not have 21st September on our books. President Rawlings, for all his attachment and affiliation with the Kwame Nkrumah ideology in 19 years, never did it. So I, I need to come in from the PNDC or NDC. He never instituted 21st September. This was a creation of Professor Mills. Am I right? Good. So let's understand that 21st September as a Founders Day has not been with us throughout our history. It has never been. So I'm saying that in, in, in response to your question, Roland, and it's a perfect one, that you said that the government, President Nana Adodan Kakufuado, has recognized that Kwame Nkrumah is not somebody, an icon that you can just somehow admit. And that has never, ever been the, the, the thought or the uh, objective of the NPP. Never. Because uh, you would have thought that, oh, we're not cancelling 20... Um, 1st September, and we're just doing August the 4th. No, but the but blowback would have been too much. It's not about blowback. No, I'm just saying. Just, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you can talk about blowback. I mean, what happened? June 4th, was it recognized under President Mahama? Was it a national holiday? It was not. Yeah. It was not a holiday. Kufo started it. President Kufo started it. When President Mills and um, John, President Mahama came to power, did they reinstitute it as a national holiday? Yeah, they, but I'm not questioning the intention. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm talking about the blowback. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, but if the MPP had done away with 21st August and not given it any due recognition, the blowback, the heat, okay. even from within the it's, party, it's would it's not be. Okay, but but that's not to question the intention, anyway. Let's say, let's say yeah. we have the Nkrumah's ideology mm. on one side, mm. the UP, Dankwa Buzia, Dombo, etc. On one side. Uh, when do we come to certain consensus on a day for a Founders Day? Perhaps maybe collapsing everything into one. Well, you see, August 4th does exactly that. It's a founders, it's encapsulating everybody. Which is why, in fact, when you read the press statement that the Director of Communications, Eugene Ahin, wrote, it, it re made reference to 1897. Again, we're looking for points of, of, of uh, uh, epochal events where we can say that, let's not forget those who trailed the blaze even for us. So it, that August 4th encapsulates everybody in that in that in that sphere and um I, I, it's 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 an, it's it's a shame moment yes do you I, think that we're being made to swallow um or take i mean or convince my pragmatic August 4 should be my, my pragmatic approach 
to all this is that you will not get consensus on August 4th. It will be a partisan agenda if it goes through. You so know, if we parliament. want the two, if we want to, we don't the need two. a specific day for Founders' Day. As some people have said, Independence Day is enough. Independence Day, this is the day that Ghana got independence. Then we can talk about all the other activities and events that led up. But beyond Independence Day, there are some very important epochal moments in our history. Kromer's birthday, 21st September, the day UGCC was formed, you know, 4th August. So all of these dates can be marked as important days. 28th February, like we always do every year, the also crossroads shooting incident. All of these, even the boycott, you know, that was championed by Nii Kobina Boni and all, all of these are important dates. So in order to avoid the controversies, because we will not get consensus on okay. that, we, let us avoid founder founder's day. We've had an NPP government day. in power before, led by... Uh, former President John Ejekun Kufo. Now mm. we have Danado um, um, Kufado. But he more like is a, is a part of that story, yeah. that heritage. He's, it's, what? He is more like a, a child of that heritage. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, and because he's that offspring, is that the reason why perhaps uh, he's taking keen interest in it? Because he wants due recognition for his ancestors? No. I don't. Th I don't think so. And J. B. Dankwa. No. His father Edward Akufo. I don't think so. Um, many, many of uh, his uncles may have played critical roles at home, etc. Not at all. Not at all. I think it's about recognizing those who have helped us ar arrive at our destiny. Right. Because President Mills, he has no connection with uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah. None at all. Politically, I'm talking about, and also family-wise. You know, the NDC have nothing to do with Nkrumah, nothing. Politically, they have no connection. The NPP or UP do, because at one point, the UGCC, from where the UP came from, and the Kwame Nkrumah were together. And so we have a history with Nkrumah, NDC do not. Why am I giving you this analogy? Uh, President Mills didn't have a, a, any affiliation, but he, he, did, he did it in terms of 21st September. What President Kufuado is doing is, in fact, recognizing that there was an epochal event that spearheaded the independence. But Ibrahim, there's really nothing wrong, if, because Nana, as you said, it's All a right. product of that generation. Yeah, but I'm saying but that I personally feel that even I have to a wrap subsequent up this MPP Please government, wrap up for me, Chief. a subsequent MPP government might not even be as passionate about this as Nana is, but justifiably so, because it's a product. But my concluding statement and all this is that, as I said, I don't feel that we have neglected anybody. I actually feel we have neglected the whole history. And, that we should, and that's why some of us are doing work by JK, because we feel that it's important for us to package <laughs> and present our histories in ways that people find exciting. Let us forget about Chief founder Moomen. of Chief Moomen is a poet, he's a, a playwright, he's a pan-Africanist. Are you also a politician too? Not you really. haven't transcended yeah. those shows yet. But Ibrahim <laughs> Ajay is a politician. Uh, he's, all, he, he's also a member of the MPP, works with the presidency, was um, with uh, the pressure group, <laughs> let my vote <laughs> count. <laughs> Who was? Why are the past tense? Is. All right. Is. <laughs> so that's where we end the conversation. Chief Moomen here and also Ibrahim Ajay. Thanks, gentlemen. Right, uh, thank we also had a great conversation mm -hmm. with um, lawyer and politician Samu Kujetu and Mama Yusuf Abwadi.